What's up everyone? Today I'm going to give you some general tips and pointers on how to make some cool grooves. Keeping beats plain and simple is fine for most playing situations, but maybe you're feeling a little creative and you want to break out of your standard box of one and three on the kick, two and four on the snare, steady eighth notes on the hi-hats. So to get things a bit more interesting, we can think about using cycles of tension and release. The concept of tension and release might feel a little abstract at first, but it's essentially the driving force behind what keeps music engaging to the listener. As it pertains to drums, we can think of tension and release as trying to strike a balance between syncopation and resolution, or playing things off of the beats and playing things on the beats. At the end of the day, we just have to find a balance. To demonstrate what I mean by that, let's take a look back in history at a couple of important drum beats. The first one I want to mention is Cold Sweat by James Brown with Clyde Stubblefield on drums. The main drum beat is two measures long, but there's a displaced backbeat in there. So instead of always hitting the snare drum directly on beats two and four, in the first measure, the backbeat is pushed behind beat four. Instead of landing right on four, it ends up happening on the and of beat four. And then there's no solid kick on beat one of the second measure. So for a couple of beats, the time feels a little disjointed and everything sort of floats for a second. It creates tension. And then he puts the backbeat back on to beat two of the second measure, which releases that tension. It allows the listener to find the time again. Everything resolves. Tension, release, syncopation, resolution. Just gotta have a balance. Another iconic drum beat that was thrown down a few years after the Cold Sweat Groove is from Herbie Hancock's Chameleon with Harvey Mason on drums. The main groove here is only one measure long, but it still has one of those displaced backbeats. So instead of hitting the snare drum directly on beat two, that backbeat is nudged ahead by a 16th note. So it happens on the uh of beat one, or the last 16th note of beat one. I think we would all agree that those beats groove hard as heck, and they don't just have four to the floor and constant backbeat. It's not just like your typical disco groove. And it shows us that we don't have to just pound four to the floor and keep steady backbeats for things to be groovy. With both of those beats, there is a steady pulse on the hi-hats that behaves as a sort of common thread that allows us to get away with a bit more inventive phrasing on the kick and snare. In Cold Sweat, we had steady eighth notes on the hi-hats, and in Chameleon, there's also eighth notes, but there's this accent on each beat. Another way to dig deeper into this general concept of tension and release is with linear drumming. If you haven't heard that term before, linear drumming refers to lacing all of your limbs together, or like interlocking your limbs. Basically, no two sounds hit at the same time. There is some flexibility to that definition if you're playing a full measure of 16th notes and there's one part where the bass drum and the hi-hats line up or something that doesn't negate the entire linear nature of that pattern. I would say it's still linear. Don't think too hard about it. Point being, most of the rhythms will be built around our limbs split apart from one another. A good example of a linear beat is actually a songo, which is a Cuban groove that sounds like this. So in a songo, there's generally no alignment between the limbs, but there is still a steady quarter note on the hi-hats, 
all of the accents on the snare drum are syncopated. They occur on either the and or the uh of a beat. And the bass drum is playing a rhythm known as a tumbao, so it's hitting on the last 16th note of beats one and three, as well as the and of beats two and four. But it still grooves super hard, despite it obeying different rules than funk or like American styles of dance music. Another example of a groove that uses a lot of limb lacing is from that Tower of Power tune, Soul Vaccination, with David Garibaldi on drums. I guess this would count as two examples, because I'm going to play two grooves from that song, but both of them use a lot of limb lacing and then some embellishments where there's some overlap between the limbs. So the first one I'm going to play happens during the intro of the song, and then it comes back a little bit later in the tune. Things to watch out for. Bass drum does not ever play on beat one during this groove, and the snare drum is not ever playing a steady backbeat, but it is still wicked cool. That groove has a huge Afro-Cuban influence on it. David Garibaldi was heavily inspired by Cuban and South American music. And the bass drum that kind of feels like beat one is actually happening on the last 16th note of beat four. So it has an anticipated downbeat. And the other groove from that song is notorious among drummers. It's all kick snare hats. And there's so much overlapping between the limbs. A lot of flam types of patterns in there. A lot of Swiss army triplet type things going on. But that beat sounds like this. So what if you wanted to make your own groove using the concept of tension and release, or syncopation and resolution? First, we want to start with a steady rhythm on the hi-hats. I think starting with quarter notes is a good idea, it gives us a bit of space to play around with, and those hi-hats are going to provide a nice anchor point, which will give our kick and snare a little bit more flexibility. So I'm going to throw down a two-measure groove underneath quarter notes on the hi-hats. It's going to start off pretty resolute. I'll play the kick right on beat one and the snare right on beat two. And then after that, everything's going to be a little bit more disjointed. The kick and snare will mostly occur off of the beats. And we'll see if this one has that much sought-after balance. I like that. I think that sounds pretty nice. Definitely has some tension because we're not hitting a kick right on beat one of the second measure, and we never just have a steady straight ahead back beat, but you could still sort of bob your head to that quarter note on the hi-hats. And it always comes back solidly on beat one, or it resolves on beat one every two measures. So it's not too much tension. It's got some release in there too. We could also create the feeling of tension and release while still having a steady backbeat on the snare drum. So now I'm gonna play this weird kind of cracked out shuffle triplety type thing, but the tension and release is gonna occur primarily between the bass drum and the hi-hats. A lot of the kicks are gonna sort of dodge playing on the beats. They're gonna happen on some of the triplet upbeat partials. And that weird cracked out shuffle triplety thing's gonna sound like this.
So there I was messing around with a few different phrases between the bass drum and the hi-hats, and there was one stretch in there where I really didn't touch beat one with a kick for quite a while. And the longer you allow that tension to hold, the listener really might start losing the actual beat underneath it. So we gotta resolve it every now and then. Still, it's all about finding that balance. We could also use polymeters and polyrhythms to create this sort of effect. I like doing this a lot in 3-4, messing around with a lot of like four against three patterns. So I'll still keep quarter notes on the hi-hats, but now everything is in a three beat cycle. And I'm primarily gonna play a four between my kick and snare and phrase around that polyrhythm. Pass the bread and butter. Pass the bread and butter. But maybe we do want to do something that is a little bit more straight ahead. So let's say I do still have a solid kick on beats one and three and a solid backbeat on two and four with my snare drum. For this example, let's actually use quintuplets. So when I play quintuplet grooves, I'm usually thinking of a couple different hi-hat patterns and then I try to phrase things around those patterns. The two patterns that I use the most on the hi-hats are like the first, third, and fifth quintuplet of each beat. or the first, third, and fourth quintuplet of each beat. So if I have my kicks on one and three, snares on two and four, if I'm gonna embellish that at all, I usually try to make those embellishments happen in the little holes of the hi-hat pattern. So if I'm playing the first, third, and fifth quintuplets on the hi-hats, I'm gonna try to add either ghost notes or extra accents on the snare or extra kicks on either the second or fourth parts of the beat. Or if I were playing the first, third, and fourth quintuplets on the hi-hats, I would try to add the embellishments on either the second or fifth part of the beats. And that adds a lot of depth to grooves because we have more staggering between the limbs, so every voice really gets a chance to stand out. So I'm just gonna do a little quintuplet groove scramble, but really pay attention to where the kicks and snares happen in between the beats. They're probably gonna happen in the little holes of the hi-hat pattern. Let's see what we can do. And with pretty much anything that I just demonstrated here, instead of playing on the hi-hats, you can move your right hand over to the ride cymbal, and that might give your right hand the freedom to break its own pattern up a little bit if our left foot can keep some kind of steady thread throughout whatever you're playing. Try to make your own beats with consideration to tension and release and just kind of finding a balance and see what kind of things you could come up with. If you like what you saw in this video, check out my Patreon page. Your support grants you access to transcriptions for this video as well as transcriptions for all my other lesson videos. And follow me on Instagram at drummerhar to see more videos of my playing. As always, thanks for watching and see you next time.